I'm talking about publicity rights in the U.S., which are quite different from a lot of your European schema. So, as everyone here probably knows, the right of publicity is the right to control your voice, your signature, your image, your likeness, your mannerisms, and it is really integrated with the right to protect a celebrity's income stream. Now, why the maps? In the U.S., the right of publicity is protected via each state. So there is no federal right. You have to look at the rights of each 50, each of the 50 states that we have in order to determine how the celebrity's income stream can be best protected. So taking the states of New York and California, there are very, very different treatments with respect to the right of publicity. One has uh, quite a number of protections in California and limited protections actually in New York. And why is this? Depends on whether the celebrity is alive or dead. So if the celebrity is alive, one has about equivalent protections in New York and California. So it's fine no matter where you live, you're okay, New York versus California. However, there's a huge difference when the celebrity dies. So, the first question one asks as an attorney or as an agent or as a celebrity is where does the celebrity live? Where are they domiciled? Now, second question. Does the celebrity have a personal services contract with her own company? And this becomes important when you look at whether First, you look at the domicile, and then you look at the contract. Now, does this contract cover the descendable right of publicity where that right exists? So, has the celebrity said, you company or my estate, you're going to get all of those rights, all that bundle of rights, so that you can control them after I die? Now, that's only applicable if you have a state which has a descendable right of publicity. And in most states, most states that have the actual statutes, how long does that descendable right of publicity last? It can be 25 years, it can be 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 80 years, 100 years is the longest one of which I'm aware. So can you get that descendable right of publicity if you die in that state? No, not unless you're in Washington or Indiana which both have states that say the descendable right of publicity attaches no matter where you die. A state like California, you actually have to be domiciled in California, and then it's still an open question of whether if you die somewhere else, does that descendable right cover? Right now, the courts have said yes. So then you look at what state your governing company was formed. So if you have your rights, personal services contract with your own company, and your governing state, your company is formed in, is California, then you're completely covered. The governing state in which that company was formed is New York, but you're domiciled in California, then you may eventually have a tussle between what laws govern, California or New York. So for a lot of celebrities that are bi-coastal, this becomes a very critical issue. And if you want a discernible right of publicity and you want to protect that income stream for your client, you may want to consider having that client be clearly domiciled in California and having California laws govern that client and that client's personal service contracts and the client's company. Now, how do you exploit these celebrity rights? Well, usually manufacturing or licensing. And the celebrity is going to want a lot of contractual provisions controlling that image, as we heard in the earlier presentation. And then the next is, has the IP lawyer consulted with the state's lawyer? Which doesn't usually occur. It's not what you typically think of. But you have to, in this particular discipline, in order to protect your client's rights, the company's rights, as you know, they may die. Now, Marilyn Monroe. Uh, she was a New York resident, 
New York has no rights, descendable rights. So what has happened? Her estate has had, and, and her agents in CMG, which control some of the copyrighted images, not this one, this one's in the public domain, um, has had some litigation over this. And the New York court said clearly, California law doesn't apply. It's uh, New York. We don't have a descendable right of publicity. Uh, all of the bills have stalled in, uh, in Albany. And therefore, if you do not control the copyright of her image, and there are a number of images of Marilyn Monroe, Monroe that are not, uh, you know, copyrighted, they're in the public domain, uh, then you cannot govern the use of this image. So therefore, you find quite a number of goods that have a Marilyn Monroe image on it, and as long as they don't say Marilyn Monroe, they can be sold freely. So her estate gets absolutely no revenue from the use of any of these non-copyrighted images, and that's just, you know, the story. And the estate and the agent, uh, CMG, are quite well aware of this situation. I actually dealt with this issue last week. And they will tell you that, uh, you know, well, you know, you want to use one of our licensed images? Lovely. We'd, we'd absolutely love the revenue. But, you know, there are unlicensed images that you can use, and just be aware that you shouldn't use the name Marilyn Monroe. So this is a very real effect of Marilyn Monroe being on the East Coast and not the West Coast and having New York govern rather than California. Excuse me. Yes, of course. Just add something regarding my Monroe, because authentic brand estate yes. about the publicity right and also the trademark Marilyn Monroe. And be sure <laughs> that I will question that. And regarding Marilyn Monroe images, authentic authentic brand claim to be the ownership of publicity rights and the trademark of Marilyn Monroe. And we pay a lot to you the uh, image and uh, since the beginning uh, we as uh, Marilyn Monroe used to wear number five right. <laughs> Chanel mm -hmm. number five in uh, regarding all these low cases that we know pretty well uh, regarding this is actress and uh, the territory of Residents or or um, this, um, it was we were comfortable to say, oh, we can use Marilyn Monroe without any appro approval, and we do that for um, um, communication through internet, not ad. And we decided two years ago to launch a new film with Marilyn Monroe and Authentic Brown. They sent us a season decade later, but they. We are the owner of Marilyn Monroe publicity rights, and we own the trademark Marilyn Monroe. So, it's it's Authentic Brand is a Bill Gates company yes. uh, owned by Corbis. So, uh, I'm very um, uh, interesting by <laughs> what do you feel about this kind of estate who claim to be the owner of publicity rights and. Well, there is a New York State case on this point, and it is very clear, and it's gone around and around and very clear, and they say that the publicity rights did not survive her death. So if you're using an uncopyrighted image, and you are not saying Marilyn Monroe, because they definitely own the trademark rights, um, then uh, the case law is pretty clear that uh, they cannot control it. Now, they can use their might to scare people away, but, you know, the, the cases say that she does not have a descendable right of publicity. So, you know, it's, and CMG will tell you, because they own the majority of the images, that, you know, no, we're not, if you want to use, let's say, the photo play image, um, that is not an issue. So uh, I'd, I'd be quite interested to see on what grounds they are saying that the New York State case does not apply. Yes. Now, Trademark, yes. Trademark Cannot use it. <laughs> right. <laughs> then you get into <laughs> false endorsement and all of that. Yeah, but yes. so far, uh, no. <laughs> they, they, as far as I'm aware, they haven't succeeded. So it's, uh, but it's quite interesting. It really depends on where you're going to cite your celebrity in what state, and that affects a lot of their personal decisions. 
So, now, our Supreme Court has spoken about right of publicity once. Uh, rather long ago, there was a, a family called Zucchini, and they uh, their family business was being shot out of these rockets, and a, a bit of a dangerous business, so they really, you know, the money that they received was quite important to them. And Scripps, which is a broadcasting company, um, basically a reporter taped the entire presentation and then used it on the news. And Zucchini said, you can't do that. You know, you're taking away my right to make money out of my right of publicity. And so the question was, because uh, this was the defense of uh, Scripps, what is the impact of the First and Fourteenth Amendment? And the First Amendment, you know, quite quite well known, and does have an impact on current right of publicity cases, so you can, anything is news. So for, for uh, Right, so, so for the, the New York, the First Amendment is basically, you know, you have the freedom of speech. You can say whatever you want within limits, if it's non-commercial. So Scripps was arguing, well, we're a news organization, it's automatically non-commercial. And Zucchini said, no, you've taken my entire presentation. So you're moving it from non-commercial, even though you are a news organization, into the commercial space. And this went up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, in the first statement on this issue, said, okay, your privacy right is a reputation right, akin to placing someone in a false light, mental distress, defamation. Your publicity right is your interest in governing how you're perceived from about you, which is protected by the First Amendment, but who gets to publish it and who gets to make money off of it. And this is, I have my presentation printed out, you'd like to take it, I'm not going to read this whole thing. Um, but they basically said that Scripps could not appropriate the entire presentation from which Zucchini and the Zucchini family made money. So it, the Supreme Court established the right of publicity. However, that was not followed by any federal law. So it left it to the states to decide how to govern it, as we've discussed. So there have been some really interesting cases in the right of publicity realm. One involving Vanna White, who is an actress on Wheel of Fortune, which you may have seen. It's a very, very long-running show where they have this big wheel, and Vanna just sits there and motions at the wheel, and she's become famous for it. She's a celebrity. So, in 2002, someone decided to make a robot, Vanna, and use it. So Vanna White had a big problem with this. She really did not like her robotic image. It wasn't flattering. And what happened? The court said, and this is the Ninth Circuit, California again, and Vanna is still alive, so we don't get into the descendable rights. Court said, yes, we think that invades, the use of the robot invades her right of publicity. And they gave her, you know, that injunction, and no more Vanna white robots without any licenses. So, the right, the likeness, the image right, extends to robots. It also extends in the U.S. to sound alike. So we've had cases involving Bette Midler and Tom Waits. We've had look-alike cases that involve other people that look like an actor. So there was a case involving Woody Allen and a, and a look-alike actor, clearly not Woody Allen himself, but the right of publicity, the image right, extends to Woody Allen. And then actual people, Liam Neeson and Bradley Cooper, their images were used inappropriately. They challenged. They won. So in the U.S., this right is quite expensive. Now, real people. So we've had cases with famous basketball player, Jimi Hendrix, the governor. And the Jimi Hendrix case was interesting because this illustrates a split in the law. Jimi Hendrix died in New York. Hmm? We spoke about this earlier. But his company was set up in Washington, the state of Washington, not our, our capital. And Washington 
after the first case involving Jimi Hendrix, where they said, well, he died in New York, there's no descendable right of publicity, Washington changed its law. And the Washington law is now extremely broad and applies to a Washington company to which the descendable rights were granted, no matter where the celebrity lived and no matter where the celebrity died. So, and it was retroactive forever. So what happened is, Jimi Hendrix's company brought the lawsuit again under this new Washington law and won. Res judicata did not apply, and now Jimi Hendrix's rights are to, of publicity are preserved. Now, that's out of the Ninth Circuit. New York still sees it differently. There was a case involving a recent Indiana law, very similar to the Washington law. And New York said, no, we don't care what the Indiana law says. This person died here. Our law governs. There's no right of publicity. So really critical, again, where the celebrity lives. If they live and die in New York, they're stuck. All of those rights completely die. That income stream dies. So it's really critical to involve the IP lawyer with the estates lawyer, with the corporate lawyer, and to, to plan all of this out, plan where you live at the very beginning, if you want that income stream to continue. Now, what kind of violations have been brought in these cases? So obviously, if there's a statutory right of publicity, that violation is pled. Some states don't have a state law yet, so then it's common law. So a common law right of publicity. The Lanham Act, trademark infringement, if the name is protected, and then false advertising and false association. So those are the common causes of action brought. And these cases are typically brought in federal court because the Trademark Act, unlike the Copyright Act or the Patent Act, permit you to bring trademark causes of action in state court as well as federal court. So it's the only dual jurisdiction. So, since this is all splintered, you've got a whole bunch of different legal tests that apply. Here in the Second Circuit, which governs New York, they look at the relationship between the celebrity image and the work as a whole. And this dates from 1989 to Ginger Rogers. And she brought action against a movie that was titled Ginger and Fred. And the court basically said that the title was clearly related to the content of the movie, which had absolutely nothing to do with Ginger Rogers, and therefore the right of publicity was not invaded. But they established this relatedness or restatement test in doing so, and that's what New York courts now apply. So, back to the First Amendment. They are looking at a constraint of defense so that there is freedom of expression on the one hand and invasion of the right of publicity on the other hand. And, you know, these cases can become quite interesting as a result if you have a news entity on the other side. Now, what does California do? So, similar, but they're looking at whether there is a transformation of the right of publicity. So let's say that you take the image and you completely change it and you're doing a parody. Is that an invasion of the right of publicity? In some cases, yes. Some cases, no. Here it was a Three Stooges drawing, and it was clearly invasion because they were just using the image of the Three Stooges to sell the apparel, and there was no transformation. So, again, whether the image is original, whether it's transformed, is it the celebrity's likeness, is it something really, really creative that basically takes it out of the celebrity? Now, a little bit about contracts. We discussed, you know, how you set up your company, where you set up your company. But how are you going to protect that image in the contract? How broad a right are you going to grant? Not only for this contract, but for your future contracts. Do you want to restrict the celebrity? Does the licensee want to restrict the celebrity? Well, yes, they want, you know, the celebrity to be non-competitive, exclusive, so on and so forth. So all of these rights come into play. Um, very important clause. You don't want your licensee 
challenging or defaming the celebrity. You don't want the celebrity challenging or defaming the licensee. Uh, what kind of approval rights are you going to have? How fast can the celebrity get back to the brand? You know, the brand's going to want pop, pop, pop. Two days, three days, seven days. Celebrity may be on location. You're not going to get it. Will the agent have the right in that case? The celebrities that I work with, they want the control. So this becomes an important part of negotiation. Um, will a celebrity be available for launch? And what does that entail? Does that entail full eight hours? Does it entail two hours? Where is it going to be? So all of these practical business considerations come into your drafting of the license. And what happens if the celebrity dies? So in a California, those rights continue and your program continues. In New York, there are no descendable rights. So how do you work that out? So, you know, these are all issues that one has to be aware of. Um, then you have, as you know, we've already gone over the cancellation rights and, you know, what happens if the celebrity gets ill, all contractually negotiated, or at least it should be. And whether approvals need to be in person by Skype, you know, are you sending a file that they can review? And then how much information is the celebrity entitled to? So similar with endorsement contracts for products, but in the U.S., product endorsement has turned out to be very interesting because what happens is the courts are not protecting the products with a right of publicity as they have protected celebrities. So what's happened is you've got a lot of passive passive product placement where the celebrity or the product, they don't know that it's being placed. So Wilson, the Wilson soccer ball or football ball in, um, in the movie, they weren't asked for permission. Part of the movie, FedEx was shipping all of these balls. The ball went on with Tom Hanks to the island, and it became a character in the movie. Wilson didn't protest, but what would have happened had Wilson protested? They wouldn't have won, because the case law has said that products don't have this expansive right, and these are non-copyrighted products. Same thing with the monoblonic <coughs> shoes, which were very portrayed very uh, frequently in Sex and the City. You know, they couldn't control that use of the image. And it gets even more interesting because you've got active, where a celebrity is appearing in the show with the products that are paid. But again, that's the linking of the product and the celebrity image. Here, Stolichnaya and Budweiser, they wanted off this flight. Okay, they, their products were used. Denzel Washington, character he was playing, was getting drunk off of these products. This was not the image that Budweiser and Stolknaya wanted portrayed. They sent a letter to Paramount. Paramount told, you know, told them, okay, take your own flight, but you're not getting off this one. Um, so they, and they did not choose to sue because according to current case law, they probably would have lost. D Denzel Washington was, at, was playing a um, alcoholic pilot. Yeah. And, and he chose these products to get drunk with. And, you know, this was not the image that the brands wanted to portray, but they could not control it. Now, would it, so, you know, under these tests, it's very difficult to stop. Um, now, would it have been different if those products had been copyrighted? So in the U.S. now, the Copyright Office is registering some packaging. You can control the image of your packaging through copyright, if you register it properly. So the situation probably would have changed had those packages, those images, been copyrighted. So you're talking about a completely different right. Now, there's a couple of interesting cases. One is this actress, Cindy Lee Garcia. She was hired, she did her part, and then this movie, Innocence of Muslims, had her in it, and her part was completely changed. So this has gone up and down and up and down to the Ninth Circuit, which is California. And in the Ninth Circuit said, her, because the contracts did not specify that she was assigning her copyright rights in her individual performance, that it was possible that she could have 
copyright rights in that performance. Now, since that decision, the Copyright Office said no, she doesn't have separable copyright rights in that performance, and the Ninth Circuit has revised uh, this decision. But it establishes an important precedent with respect to individual copyright rights. Now, is it going to go anywhere? Probably not. Um, the studios are going to make sure that all of those rights are uh, granted in their contracts, but this was a, a quite an interesting case. And there's another one now that came out of the Ninth Circuit involving uh, images of two of the actors from this show set in Boston called Cheers. Animatronic figures were created uh, using, obviously, the actor's image, because the actors you know, are the characters, given with permission from Paramount. The actors sued, saying, we didn't give permission. And the Ninth Circuit actually agreed with them. It's a very strong dissent, but so far, right now in the Ninth Circuit, the even though the studio owns the performance, the actors own their individual images. Again, I'm sure they're going to fix this via contracts and make sure that this loophole is uh, tightened up, but right now, with prior contracts, especially if they're not revised, the actor can stop the studio copyright owner from making animatronic figures using their images. So, which is a very interesting uh, dichotomy between copyright law and the rights of publicity. So, thank you. Any questions? Are you finished? Yes, I am. All right. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, that copy of images, like the program, the spitting images, where it was just comment, would that be, would they be able to stop that as well? Or is it only when it's used to make the commercial? Uh, well, it depends on the jurisdiction. So most of the statutes have a trade or commercial aspect, but not all of them. So, you know, you can have an injunction, depending on where you are, against the use of your image, even if it's non-commercial. Uh, but not if it's for a newsworthy purpose. So if it's clearly, absolutely newsworthy, it's covered by the First Amendment, and that's a complete defense. So where's the best place to die in America? California. <laughs> and live. Mm -hmm. And live. Live and die in California. Have all of your contracts in California um, for that reason, until New York gets with it, because we're losing a lot of revenue because of it. Sure, I don't. Yes. Given the differences in um, uh, systems throughout the U.S., um, just wondered why they haven't been in the mood to try and harmonize that for national. Mm. So you may be familiar with our um, Congress, which is you know slightly um, dysfunctional. So uh, you know to get anything even on the IP front through Congress is impossible. And you have a huge states' rights movement. So to tell the states at this point that their various laws are going to go by the wayside, it's not going to happen. So have descendable rights in New York or California? So California has descendable rights, New York doesn't. No, I just wonder, uh, you know, obviously New York thinks that's the right thing to do, California thinks it's the right thing to do, I just wonder why, why the divergent views are Why the divergent views? Because um, basically Albany, which is where our state government is seated, also for many, many years was dysfunctional and simply couldn't get their act together, even on what would seem to be a, a law that would benefit New York commercially. Yeah, and uh, hopefully that will change in the next couple of years, because our, govern our current governor has been pretty successful. Um, but, you know, it's all about whether you can get people across the aisle to talk to each other to build something that will be <coughs> stable and commercially successful. Thank you.